Well, TCS is going to be the stock of the day, so let's uh, hop across to Rima and Lata. They are speaking with the top brass at TCS. Over to you guys. Yes, sir. Uh, the big news, the, uh, earnings season has been ushered in by TCS. And to be fair, it has been a beat across all parameters. Whether you look at rupee revenue, dollar revenue, EBIT, uh, profit, it's been a beat. Uh, so congratulations, Rajesh and uh, NGS for joining us from me and Reema, you know, first congratulations, but uh, we are going to ask you uh, the, the more uh, skeptical questions first. Sure. Uh, it's sort of take away from the performance. Well, uh, Rajesh, you know, the big question that every investor I spoke to yesterday was asking me, please ask Rajesh, how do you look at the downside scenario? You did say that your clients are looking at scenarios. What exactly do you mean by the downside scenario? First of all, welcome Lata and uh, Rima. It's a pleasure to have both of you back here with us and uh, thank you for having us on the show. Um, as I said, this has been a good quarter and uh, we have always been focused on staying very close to our customers and uh, you know, staying very close to the opportunity spectrum. And it's like driving in traffic. When you look at it from a distance, it looks all very, very crowded. But when you drive on the ground, there are enough spaces in between. And if you drive straight, you will you know, pretty much do drive safe and go far. And that's the perspective with which we have always gone to our business. So I know that there's a lot of questions about the macro, but we are not well placed to actually comment on it. My only thing would be that to look at TCS, uh, not as a proxy on the macro, but uh, evaluate it from the lens of a good business run well. And uh, towards that, even though I say myself, uh, I have no doubt that on behalf of all my colleagues, we can say that uh, we have done a commendable job. And we stay very focused on doing that. So our ability to comment beyond that is limited. And uh, there's nothing incremental that we can add to the spectrum of uh, commentary that is out there about uh, all the various scenarios and all the positives, negatives, all the stuff that. So I would like to hold back on that. OK. No, I'm sorry. I'm persisting only because I want to get some color. You may not be able to give numbers, obviously. But you speak to really a large segment of you know, BFSI, retail. Uh, so if you can give us some color on what exactly did your clients tell you? Did they say uh, we cannot speak much about Q1 next year? What did they tell you? Any verbatim quotes without naming the clients? Well, Lata, we called it out last quarter also. We said there is an increasing <coughs> cautionary tone in our clients' uh, discussions. Uh, that is not resulting in a project cancellation. Are they not saying that we are at panic stations? But uh, there is that caution. And people asking around, what are you hearing from others? Actually, a lot of that happens. That uh, is saying, we have an order backlog, but uh, what are you hearing from the others that you are meeting? And that kind of a drumbeat is building up. From our perspective, when you go into a planning session, uh, season, like uh, the next few months, with that as the backdrop, the chances are that uh, the next year's plans are likely to be weighed on the downside. Uh, that doesn't mean that uh, people are not in an active, uh, you know, uh, cost management phase yet, where they're pulling back significantly. That's it right. is just a question of how they are reprioritizing. Uh, so even if you look at cloud, uh, mm -hmm. there was a lot of uh, you know, enthusiasm on cloud from the board level onwards. Now, if you look at the news flow over the last uh, six months or so, you would find that a lot of that uh, has gone off the radar. Right? We are now into the trenches of actually executing on many of the things that were spoken about. And uh, that's a good space for us because, uh, you know, yes, you lay out the future roadmap, but the hard work needs to be done. The first 20, 30 percent gets shifted. But uh, the real uh, difficult area and the place where we differentiate ourselves the most is when you start getting to the next 30 percent and the next 30 percent. Okay. That's when the heavy lifting starts. And like in any other business, typically the value realization is always at the tail end of any such transformation. Okay. The, uh, first, the uh, first one third is a cost burn, uh, or rather uh, you're investing. The value realization comes at the bottom end. That's probably the tail end. That's the one. So news flow goes away, excitement goes away. That doesn't necessarily mean that business uh, okay. goes away. It goes into the trenches and I think we are well positioned to be able to execute on the actual value of the transformation that we still believe in. Got it. But you need to get those workloads in there. You need to get the refactorings done. 
you need to run the optimization to be able to capture the new dynamics of the new operating environment then you will realize the benefits Fair. and uh, i would say that as we look forward into the next 6 to 12 months or 18 months we are going to go to a period of execution focus okay. of operational rigor of uh, you know not about news flow okay. but about actually getting the work done and that I believe is TCS's uh, sweet spot. And uh, that's where we believe that, you know, yes, we need to be vigilant. Yes, we need to be. But overall, I think that we are in a good place. Okay. We have a credibility with our customers and uh, their plans. Uh, we are not seeing them pull back. They stopped okay. talking about it, but they're not pulling back because okay. it needs to get executed. Okay. okay, got that. But your raw material is still manpower. And, uh, you know, NGS, the latest employment number we got, unemployment number, as low as three and a half, it's never been so good for uh, the American worker. Now, your you know, on-site workers would be about 25-30%. Won't that continue to be expensive and you know, higher attrition and therefore higher wages and therefore a problem for margins? I think you know, all said and then all on-site markets, right, whether it's uh, US or Europe or UK, they are supply constrained. Okay, so to that extent, you know, depending on the, the quality of resources, you know, uh, people with the market knowledge, uh, client knowledge, industry knowledge, uh, they'll always come at a price point, right? So our model is about constructing a team uh, of multidisciplinary skills that are required to execute the project. Some are on a high cost location, some will be on a low cost location so that the overall value proposition from a cost perspective as well as from a technology perspective uh, is attractive and at the same time it is uh, uh, it comes without any added risks to the project of execution you know i think we have been uh, doing that very well in a way that's our secret sauce right yeah but it's not tell it you don't expect it to tell on margins you were very confident about 25 percent uh, margins by the end of the year and uh, i think samir even said 26 to 28 is uh, very much on the anvil but it has to get postponed isn't it if labor is so scarce and expensive see first is that you know it's about uh, being closer to the client and what promises that we are making on every execution make sure that is going well right and in the process there is an operational rigor that ensures that we do it without wastage without um, taking you know unnecessary risks okay. and see how much of automation can be done how much of predictability that can be brought into execution so that we deliver well and once you deliver well and you know how to take the juice out and actually to deliver the margins that we need out of that project. Uh, Rajesh, could you tell us in the current quarter, which were the segments, pockets where you saw growth moderation? You spoke about insurance, but were there any others? And a follow-up is that in a downside scenario, which other segments would get added to that? Uh, good question. Um, so insurance, as I said, uh, was a... Uh, the reason we called out is that insurance was the only weak segment in the U.S. market and that to PNC uh, insurance. And we were giving that it's not always green, there will be pockets of weakness. Um, from what we are seeing in the macro, this time the weakness is likely to come through from the manufacturing side rather than from the financial and the services side. So the uh, GFC, the weakness came first from the financial and the market yes. side. In COVID, it came from travel industry, those kind of ones. This time around, if the weakness starts, it's likely to come in from the manufacturing side. Uh, as uh, energy, supply chain uh, disruptions start, uh, okay, so we need to be wary of that. Uh, within that spectrum, we see U.S. manufacturing doing uh, very well. Uh, we see uh, some amount of caution on the European manufacturing side. And that bears watching as to how that um, plays out. And uh, we need to be careful about uh, how we are positioning on that. So it goes back to, again, that it's not a macro game. It's about what is our exposure, how are we doing? And within that setup, what are we doing for those uh, customers? And what programs are we engaged with? What's on the pipeline? Even going back to the point that uh, you just discussed with NGS, uh, you know, the on-site uh, labor 
needs to be seen in the context of our requirements of what we were wanting there. Yes. Uh, in a scenario when there is a lot of excitement, uh, especially at the senior most levels about some technology, new technology, uh, speed becomes a big part of the value. Uh, people want to show something very fast, you know, 30 days, 90 days, uh, the board is interested, everybody is uh, excited. Uh, the speed of execution rather than the certainty of execution okay. or the optimization of execution becomes the bigger commodity. At that time, you need to become a lot more dependent on quick turnaround, uh, close contact. I believe that we are crested that wave. And uh, in the, because there are no new technologies we are speaking about, cloud we have been speaking about for the last yeah. two, three years. All the, you know, all the excitement is now uh, settled in. Yes. Now comes the actual uh, work. That work can be optimized in various delivery uh, models. So it's not the same labor scenario from a demand side that we okay. see into that uh, market. So the game has to be played, um, uh, you know, based on where you are and what the pathways available to you are. Uh, that's why trying to reconcile that with the zoomed out macro okay. is a very uh, difficult task. Three and a half percent unemployment on a 100, 125 million workforce is still quite a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, place there. So we don't need, uh, that's why we need a you know, few hundreds and thousands. Uh, and just one question. Now everyone's looking ahead to January to get clarity on next year's budgeting cycle. But if there is so much uncertainty, is there a possibility that we will not get an answer in Jan? Your clients may defer the budgeting cycle by a couple of months, maybe three months, maybe six months. Is that something your clients are telling you? No, I think um, most organizations that we work with, especially the large ones, you know, they have a very uh, rigorous process of planning for uh, the future. Uh, within that, you know, with so much of uncertainties, at best, you know, their planning horizon can get shortened to, let's say, every quarter and uh, adjusted on a rolling basis for the subsequent quarters. Uh, from our interactions, what uh, they have been telling us is that, look, you know, the programs that you guys are executing, some of them are long term, some of them are short term, but then there is no pressure on those programs. Okay. When we ask them, are you going to cancel any of these programs? Right. The uh, resounding answer we got from our clients is a no, right? So which is giving us some comfort uh, in terms of at least, you know, uh, the next two quarters, I don't see any big and issues. What about embarking new programs? The new programs, you know, especially the long-term commitments, we see some softness, right? If there are, we are talking about, let's say, a multi-year execution kind of a programs which we, use, we typically deal with, uh, there is a, some amount of softness, some amount of, uh, you know, decisioning might uh, get deferred, right, mm -hmm. if I can use that word. But, but it's a function of, you know, uh, how this next three, four months is going to pan out, especially from a European perspective. You know, if there are going to be um, energy crisis, if there are going to be factories are going to be shut down, uh, and so on, so on. And then the other thing that we are also hearing is that, look, there is a recession or there is an inflationary pressures. Um, if I'm going to get some costs uh, because of that, you know, sh should I be passing all the costs to the consumers, right? Some of them feel, no, they have an obligation, their societal responsibility not to pass on all the costs. So they're doing all these scenarios, right, in terms of figuring out how they should to be. bear part of the cost burden since they can't pass on the entire amount. And then what does it mean in terms of price increases? Uh -huh. Is there a sense that billing could yeah. be a no, no such discussions have taken place. But then, you know, our model is always to be with the client, closer to them, reactive to situations, be with them in good times and bad times. Make sure that the overall long-term long -term relationship is uh, taken forward in the right direction. Okay. If it means that we have to give, a, uh, in, give in to some of their requests, we will give in. But then, you know, in this business, I've seen it for the last four decades, whatever goes out, comes back many times over. Okay. All right. Well, I, I'm, we're going to ask you a few little more about the verticals, but before we get to that, Rajesh, uh, we saw the uh, Tata group in a consolidation mode. Seven steel companies have come together 
do IT companies also come together? <laughs> NGS is much better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, between the I think two of you. More of, uh, you know, uh, are we I mean, on you the have same value? Uh, no, so Technologies Tata Networks, and you're now the heading Tejas Networks. Tata Technologies. So, so the question is, are you on the same value chain? Or are you on parallel uh, value chains? I, we don't have a dependency on any other upstream or downstream. Okay. So there is no immediate impact from that perspective. Uh, from the perspective of whether uh, it makes sense for uh, both sides, that we can see. But unlike uh, some of the other uh, industries, we are not, uh, you know, on the value chain, we are not uh, distributed. We have an end-to-end -end control over our value chain. Okay. That gives a, pa a, part, uh, uh, you know, a part answer. Uh, but, uh, okay, Rajesh, to come back to what uh, Reena was asking about verticals, you spoke about insurance being lower. Uh, haven't the BFSI clients told you that they have to be more cautious or slow down? I mean, JB Diamond was on our channel clearly saying that, uh, you know, he sees recession here and that's the biggest banker you get. Uh, Credit Suisse already having problems. So BFSI should, should have hinted more to you? No, these large banks, their total spend... Uh, in tech and ops is north of uh, 10 billion dollars and uh, we make uh, maybe 100 million a few hundred millions out of them so what happens on the margin might have some amount of uh, you know intermediate pressure but it's not uh, so that commentary needs to be seen in the larger context of their business whereas the value that we provide to them is across a full spectrum of both growth and optimization so I'm quite confident that uh, we have a value proposition in all scenarios. Uh, we have a value proposition in their uh, growth scenario. We have a value proposition in the transformation scenario, okay. in their compliance scenario, in their risk management scenario, in their consolidation uh, scenario. So it's a question of being able to address that. And we have the credibility with our client base that uh, we can have the conversations. Okay. And I think we are well positioned and uh, our clients also understand us well. Okay. And uh, we are fairly, you know, uh, focused on who we are and what we do. Okay. And uh, I think that has resonance across the full spectrum. So insurance and manufacturing, you said, not so much BFSI you would mean in terms of a slowdown next year. Capital markets are volatile. They will be the first to react. Yes. But uh, the question, what I said, as an industry, yeah. uh, it's unlikely that capital markets can uh, survive even if trading goes down 50 percent sure. uh, you know. uh, this uh, deal win guidance quarterly run rate of seven to nine billion is it only till fi 23 comes to an end or do you think this is a sustainable medium term kind of a guidance i think it is sustainable, sustainable. Uh, and we should be uh, both it is sustainable and we should be targeting that to maintain some uh, momentum but uh, at seven to nine is a comfortable uh, band for us Okay. Would you fear it could be on the downside of the 7 to 9, considering that people are taking longer to decide, which is what you said? See, overall, uh, our qualified pipeline as well as the overall pipeline looks good. Right? We are working on a mixture of uh, deals and it's broad based. Okay. It's, uh, we have deals coming from emerging markets, new growth markets, uh, as well as the established markets across verticals. It's not that look, it's concentrated in one vertical and not uh, okay. in the other. So that gives us the confidence and comfort that yes, we are in the right track, we have the products and we have the services footprint to actually convert okay. them and as we move along. And I think uh, seven to nine is a good range to okay. operate in at this point in time. Just one more question um, about this possibility of discounting. I know you have long-term relationship with clients, you treasure it, you value it, and therefore in hard times you may have to give discounts to your clients to support them. Are we seeing, are there more instances that TCS or the tech industry has to give discounts today because of the way macros are unfolding versus say six months back or even a year back? I don't think so. I mean, we are not in a, uh, see, it becomes material in a scenario like COVID, you know, when there is a sudden downturn. Okay and there is a across the board uh, pressure, then these things become material. Otherwise, in the regular uh, you know, ebb and flow of business, uh, some things will be given, some things will be taken, that's okay, that's uh, the normal flow of things. So nothing unnatural in terms of discounting or price increases? Okay. Uh, Rajesh, you know, do you think more generally, not related to only uh, IT industry, investments in blockchain, which require a lot of money, 
uh, even 5G for that matter, could that slow down because <coughs> people are uncertain? Um, I see you have to look at it from a perspective of risk capital. Uh, risk capital towards some of these emerging uh, technologies is likely to uh, slow down. But some of the core investments in these technologies is likely to continue. Our participation is more on the core investments. Okay. Our participation is less on the risk capital. So from our side, I think the environment is likely to be a continued uh, investment into okay. blockchain, 5G, etc. Whereas at a market level, you might see a fair amount of volatility okay. on risk capital coming into these areas. Yeah, well, just a final question. Uh, um, you know, you said in a very, uh, say, maybe a, a, a quarter ago in the interview that we are a B2B company and our goal, our vision is B2C. Any progress at all on that, NGS? A lot of thinking is going on, for okay. sure. And uh, I think, you know, uh, much of what we do can be repurposed. It's not uh, uh, impossible. But at the same time, if you look at our uh, own uh, the digital technologies, if we have to be relevant, we just can't operate only on a B2B basis. Okay. Our solutions that we are providing to our B2B clients, we have to imagine their business scenario on a B2B to C basis, right? In that context that, you know, much of the solutions that we are delivering also attempts Thanks. to on this on the consumer side of it. So wish as well, right? Okay. Uh, many congratulations, Rajesh and NGS. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, Thank you much. heard it from the big bosses. After this break, we will be speaking with the CFO and uh, the CHRO, that is, of course, uh, Samir and Milin. We are back in a minute. Welcome back. We now have uh, another set of the top brass of TCS. We have with us Milind and Samir, the CHRO and the CFO. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Samir, I'm going to delve straight away into the numbers question. Uh, no more big picture. The margins, you said you're confident you'll get to 25%. But is it going to be easy to improve next year, considering that, you know, there are problems of attrition, there are problems of high cost labor in the US. So what's the scenario next year in terms of margins? Okay, let's start with Q2 yeah. and uh, uh, delivering 90 basis points from 23.1 yes. to 24, I think is Was credible. better than street our, expectation, not taking away from it. And uh, uh, our immediate priority is to exit uh, Q4 at 25. And as you rightly said, there would be a combination of things which would play out in uh, FY24. Both uh, we'll have our usual increments coming in, and we'll have to uh, we'll have discretionary expenses also coming back, and we'll have to balance that off with a uh, uh, with uh, either from productivity, either from utilization improvement, realization improvement, and that is something which uh, over the years, if you see, we have been able to manage it, and that's a task uh, on hand, and we are collectively, as I said it last time as well, we are collectively in it to do it. Uh, so, Samir, uh, can you get to 25% without any further benefit from rupee? Because if the rupee becomes a tailwind, again, in Q3 and Q4, can you surpass 25%? So, Reema, uh, inflation, uh, currency, all of it is something which we take it on our uh, PNL. and a 3.5% and, uh, kind of uh, so, average increase so, that we've so seen. So, let's take it that way. Currency is not in our hand. We expect it and we build it into our model. But we'll take it as it comes. Even if it goes on an uh, appreciating trajectory, we'll have to build it in our, into our margin. Okay. And our 25 intent is irrespective of uh, where uh, rupee goes. No, how much is dollar and non-dollar? How much is dollar and non-dollar in terms of revenue mix? Mm -hmm. So uh, approximately 55 to 57 percent is dollar. dollar. And uh, euro and GBP will be a combination of 25 to 30 percent. Yeah, it looks like at least GBP and pound will not punish you as much as it has done. Let's hope so. <laughs> okay, Milan, I wanted to ask you about attrition. Uh, you know, uh, NGS just told us that about 25 to 30% are on-site workers. And the unemployment uh, levels in the U.S. are so low. So would not attrition continue to be an issue and high wage costs because of this element in the developed markets? Okay. Oh, you are talking only about U.S. or in general? More U.S. No, I, I think uh, uh, our U.S. attrition means obviously has been more than what it has been. But the differentiation of what it has been versus what it is now is less than what we see in other geographies. Okay. You know, so we, I don't see that as a much of a challenge. From a, from a wage standpoint, yes, there is a slight increase in wage in U.S., but I think that is something which we managed through a proper mix. And because we actually are also getting a significant number of trainees in the U.S. nowadays, 
So you, U.S. trainees, you know, workforce coming from locally. They cost more, no? Trainees compared to what they would have cost last year or year before. Yeah, but the point is, you know, we also basically see differentiation in in, in the pricing. You know, when 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 we when people move and do different things, they they we we actually expect that to happen. But even that pricing, actually, from where they start to where actually eventually you know the market is 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 significantly different. Uh, Milan, I want you to comment on the tech industry, and this is not a TCS specific question. Yeah. There are a lot of reports about companies, tech companies, large ones, mid caps, delaying the onboarding of freshers. There have been instances where the variable pay has been less than, you know, maybe what was promised or what the employees anticipated. What, according to you, is the reason for that? And what is happening? I can comment about TCS first. <laughs> huh? Is it okay if I? Yes, uh, no. but then you tell us about what's happening okay. in the tech industry. All right, industry. so I, I I can only you know speculate like the way you can, but you know on the on the other part. No, you can do it better. <laughs> okay, <laughs> well I think the point is, uh, uh, we actually are, you you know we have uh, like I said earlier also we have hundred thirty hundred thousand plus trainees last year, thirty five thousand now already looking for another twelve thousand. Honoring all the offers, you know, across the board, you know, not just in India, in 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 the geographies as well. So, you know, we we don't see any 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 challenge from that point. That standpoint, variable pay. No, we we actually have been paying 100% uh, until last quarter. This quarter also, 70% uh, of our people will get 100% uh, variable pay. 30% will get based on the unit based business unit performance. That is about TCS. In general, you know, uh, there are uh, industry as a whole basically means different sized companies. You know, we scale is obviously you know makes a significant difference for us. If it is a smaller size company, obviously though some of those things will be felt. You know, we are able to manage it reasonably well because of our model, because of our, our culture efficiencies, and also obviously scale. You know, all of that comes together and make it happen. But the 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 point is smaller companies uh, definitely can have a, a bigger challenge on this front considering the situation. If the smaller companies now can come to you next uh, year, is that a likely? I, I do not see that happening in the near future at all, because I think we have been managing our supply side challenges. You know, what we have seen in the last two years and how we have dealt with it, it gives me a lot more confidence of how do we how do we deal with it in the future. Are you upping your fresher hiring target? It was 40,000. You've done 35 plus 12 in the pipeline would take you to plus 50, 52. 40, 40, yeah, 47. 35 plus 12, 47. 47. Sorry. 47. So you know, uh, that's what that's the plan right now. The 12 is also in the pipeline. You know, mm. so uh, we'll decide at the end of Q3 and and uh, beginning of Q4 if we need to do more. So you have upped it, right? From 40 yeah, to 40 is a Absolutely. given, Absolutely. and at the end of Q3, you will decide, will decide. whether you, you want to increase it further. Increase more. You know, for the market outside, the big number is that you're hiring less than you hired uh, last year. That comes as a bit of a shock, in the sense, as a bit of an indication whether you don't have enough uh, work for next year. Samir, any comments? Sure. So if you look at uh, the last two years, in FY21, when we had a flattish revenue growth, we had approximately headcount addition of 10%. Last year, we had 15% growth. We had almost 20%. So we have significantly hired ahead of uh, times and invested into the capabilities uh, or capacity building. And then we have invested incrementally on organic talent development. So I think uh, that is what is uh, now helping us in terms of uh, flexing it okay. uh, as needed. Okay. Uh, Samir, can you talk about the pricing of deals, particularly in Europe and UK? Mm -hmm. Is it under pressure? So pricing overall remains stable and there is no, nothing specific to call out across geographies. Even in uh, Europe and UK no. it's stable? Yes, absolutely. So even if clients are getting hit, they are facing inflationary headwinds, etc., they are not asking you for... So technically they are investing into uh, technology on uh, various uh, demand drivers which we have consistently called out upon and on that on a uh, overall basis we don't see any impact on deal pricing in some geography subcontracting will go up subcontracting we expect it to come down in general in, ge in general okay. in, you know, because you know the fact is some of the visas are basically you know, better us is still a challenge right now other geographies are, are, are doing better, so we expect it to come down in, 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 the, in the coming quarters. Uh, one yeah. question, Milan, based on the math of calculating LTM, 
the 12 month period, uh, etc. Uh, what will LTM attrition look like, exit LTM attrition by Q4 FI23? See, I think uh, if you look at how we, uh, the LTM is calculated and if you look at the numbers, what happened in the last two quarters, mm -hmm. even if we reduce significantly in the next two quarters, the numbers, the LTM number will not come down. In a big, 20 big way. Less. It will still be uh, around 20 percent, I would around say. 20 Okay. Then we have to call it a day, not the least, because the markets are about to open and they will pass their verdict on TCS. Thank you very much, Vinay and Sabir, for joining us. Thank you, Lata. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.